So uh, now we're going to have our se second speaker, um, Ye Jing Choi. So um, Professor Ye Jing Choi is an associate professor at uh, um, Paul Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington. And uh, she is also a, a adjunct professor at Linguistics Department and uh, affiliate of the Center for Statistics and Social Sciences. She is also a senior researcher manager at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, the AI2. Uh, her primary research interests are in the field of natural language processing, uh, mach machine learning, artificial intelligence, with broader interests in computer vision and uh, digital humanities. Uh, let's welcome Ye Jing. Okay, so um, I'm very excited about the program today. It's really fun, uh, uh, potentially thought-provoking uh, discussions about uh, how we do neural symbolic integration for uh, closing the gap between perception and cognition. Now, um, I'm going to try to say something controversial um, that perhaps um, we tend to have this assumption that symbols are something name-like or logic-like constructs, but depending on what sort of uh, closing the gap we want to do between perception and cognition, we might need to consider natural language, the full scope of it, as the symbols of uh, neural models. So uh, on a related note, um, at this point, everyone knows about system one, system two, the intuitive fast um, inferences versus the slow and more rational reasoning uh, popularized by this book, um, uh, Daniel Kahneman's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. And that sort of um, created this another belief that maybe we are done with the system one reasoning with the deep learning and we only need to figure out system two. Um, perhaps less known is his earlier work uh, published in 2003 about three cognitive systems, not just two. And if you look at um, the process part of this, uh, perception and intuition are both fast associative effortless inferences, whereas reasoning is the slow one. What's more interesting to me is the content of it, where both the intuition level reasoning as well as reasoning level reasoning um, we need to think about conceptual representations. Uh, it involves the thinking about past, the present, and future, and can be invoked by language. It does involve language. Uh, more concretely, when we think about different applications we work on, or humans are able to perform at the uh, you know, object recognition and image segmentation type applications seem to correspond more with the perception, whereas um, solving puzzles or writing programs uh, proving logic theorems, these seem like clearly system two, including, of course, reviewing CVPR papers, crafting CVPR rebuttals, non-trivial feat. And in between, we have this intuition or system one task, uh, which is about the reasoning about preconditions and post-conditions. And this is what humans do pretty much every minute of their waking moments. And we have not really solved that part. To make things a little bit more concrete, um, what sort of symbols we need to think about has a lot to do with what sort of a task we want to solve. And we don't yet have a general purpose, um, you know, one fit all type system or algorithms just yet. So it makes sense for solving puzzles, um, writing programs, we need logic, math, program related constructs. But, you know, if we are thinking about more advanced reasoning at task, or even for intuitive inferences. In this talk, I'm going to argue that natural language is the way to go. Um, but that's a big statement to make. Let me make it a little bit clear by using this example from Roger Shepard's Monsters in a Tunnel. Um, you see this example, what do you see? Two monsters in a tunnel, that's not the only thing you see. Immediately, you can reason that, well, they seem to be running as opposed to standing still on one foot, not moving at all. You also assume that the one behind it is chasing the one in the front rather than trying to just copy you know, his body movement. And then finally, you can also infer that the chaser probably has hostile intentions and the chase is afraid, even though actually these two phases are identical. So we immediately make these sort of inferences and these sort of intuitive inferences are uh, highly uh, instantaneous, in instantaneous and associative, um, very intuitive, and the sort of things that are best described through natural language and full stop, 
full scope of natural language. But I know that a lot of people still uh, prefer to equate words as natural language or graphs of words as natural language. So let me make it clearer by looking at some examples. What do you see here? This is a screenshot from um, uh, the movie, uh, uh, ah, damn it, I forgot. <laughs> um, the famous movie in which the big uh, ship sinks. So uh, you see that um, if we were to try to label things by detecting objects, um, this collectively doesn't really say much about the moment um, that you can read about the image. So then you might wonder, how about scene graph? Let's add more words and uh, some relations in between words. Um, it's much more informative. Uh, we're definitely moving into the right direction, but still you look at the image, I mean, you look at the words, uh, graphs of words, and it's a little bit hard to imagine uh, or infer the sort of stuff that we understand about this still image. Um, then again, we can also think about image captioning, which is more informative in some ways, but then it doesn't really um, talk about the way that humans understand this situation. Like, why is this a person even holding onto the statue? Is it because uh, he's trying to sell it in the water? Uh, that's clearly not the case. Uh, the person wants to hold on for his life, um, try to save himself from drowning. Um, probably also uh, reason about what happens before and after this particular moment. Um, and we do this instantaneously, effortlessly. And in some sense, um, this is really the gist of intuitive reasoning, the system one reasoning that we haven't solved yet. So. Um, given an image, what we really want to do is to be able to replicate all these complex inferences that we do, uh, which we pursued in our new work, uh, Visual Common Sense Graphs, which is about reasoning about the dynamic context of a still image, uh, led by a great student, James, uh, along with other co-authors at UW and AI2. So to recap, uh, the task that we want to pursue is given an image, we wish to think about all of this all at once, just like how humans do. Um, I'm now going to briefly talk about how we do this annotation work because it's a very complicated and non-trivial thing to do, but to just make it simpler uh, to um, describe, uh, let me point out that usually, uh, especially because our data set focuses on complex scenes, uh, there are multiple people engaged in different activities or events. So, the description that applies to person two about holding the bronze statue does not apply to uh, someone else in the, uh, in the same image. So it's important that we ground all these common sense inferences on the pair of a person and a particular event that the person is engaged in. Sometimes a same person can be engaged in two different events uh, in the same image. Now, super briefly about uh, the temporal inferences before and after, just in case you might be worried that the hypothesis of space can be a little bit too big. Uh, some people might um, annotate silly things like, well, before person two was born and then afterwards, eventually he dies. Uh, these are sort of a vacuous inferences. So in order to better constrain or guide uh, the annotation of the Turkers, we also uh, present the summary videos before and after uh, this uh, screenshot of the movie. Uh, it's optional, they don't have to look at it, but in case they want to, uh, to provide it. So we kept doing this for many, many more images. And what it uh, uh, culminates to is this graph of the images um, with lots of uh, natural language sentences. And the fun part is, when you see something like a scream for help, you can see what in what sort of a visual uh, situations uh, that uh, screaming for help might arise. And screaming, by the way, is something that involves hearing something, but we almost can, we can almost visualize that hearing action or event, even from just a still images. Crashing the car, um, we can see that, you know, what sort of images uh, might be after uh, crashing the car or before crashing the car. So we can reason about um, 
how natural language sentence uh, descriptions might uh, relate to different types of um, images. So we have this, um, uh, this sort of inferences, uh, 1.4 million such common sense inferences over 60,000 uh, complex images. Super briefly about the data set statistics. Um, these are actually from the previous paper uh, known as visual common sense reasoning. Uh, and the data comes with already grounded people annotations with the bounding boxes. So then uh, we bu built um, additional person grounded event sentences, at least two per image, and then built all these um, uh, octopus uh, edges that come out of the person event pairs, which amounts to 1.4 million inferences. Uh, which include the three types of inferences, so before and after, as well as the intent or why, the question of answering, uh, the, uh, the question why someone is doing what they're doing. And all of these are done in uh, using Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, the task uh, that this data set provides or support, there are quite a few one can think about, but the one that uh, I'm going to talk about today, since um, the paper has many more, but I'm going to focus on uh, the, this one where input is um, on the left hand side, the output is all of these um, uh, uh, empty circles. And uh, you know, if you paid attention to what Chris said earlier, um, these days pre-trained language models based on the transformer architectures are amazing. So that's exactly what we did. Um, just basically uh, sort things into a sequence of uh, image uh, portions as well as some words. And then uh, we use pre-trained uh, GPT-2 models in order to continue uh, doing uh, sort of like self-supervised or supervised training, depending on how you view it, on our data set. So that's a super brief, uh, brief um, overview of what, they, what we did for modeling. Now, whenever we make a data set these days, it's good to do sanity checks by learning from uh, previous stories like MS Coco, uh, nearest neighbors can uh, lead to uh, surprisingly good captions, primarily because in that case, um, um, maybe the complexity between the sort of images in the data set and the sort of text in the data set were not um, complex enough so that you could get lucky with nearest neighbors. So we are going to check that. More importantly though, we don't want this situation of um, being able to answer questions without even looking at the images. So uh, we're going to check that by, especially the second part, uh, we're going to provide just the text and then see how lucky we can get. So here's the quick summary of um, automatic evaluation um, based on pretty much engram-based me measures uh, like Blue and Meteor and Cider. None of this is perfect, but it gives, uh, they give some reasonable um, ideas about where we stand. So um, fortunately, the data set does require vision um, in addition to just language only, and also nearest neighbors are not going to get you very lucky. Uh, this uh, um, uh, agrees with the human evaluation result as well. Um, and so that's exciting. And we haven't solved yet, by the way. So a lot more uh, improvement to, to make from here on. Um, so let me show you some example inferences that our model is able to do. The language only, by the way, this is a still powerful model uh, based on pre-trained GPT-2 uh, fine-tuned on our data set. So person one is putting a platter on a table at an outdoor restaurant. Um, maybe it's reasonable to imagine buying groceries or getting up from the table, um, but when you look at the image, person one is actually the server. So probably a serving person uh, doesn't do the groceries or getting up from the table, but um, he had to be hired as a waiter first uh, and uh, receive an order from platter. So uh, the visual uh, textual reasoning together lead to better inferences. Similarly, in the same situation, uh, we can see that language only uh, person one now, person one um, is putting a platter on the table because uh, uh, person one wanted to have dessert. It doesn't make sense. He shouldn't probably eat the dessert at that table. Um, whereas when we look at the visual language inference together, 
uh, person one wanted to serve all the other people or greet these other people, have them to eat. So um, the results look much better. Uh, similarly, about uh, what the person might do next, uh, probably shouldn't eat from the table again. Uh, so when we look at combined the visual uh, context, we got much better results. So um, uh, for this part of the talk, um, I'm going to make first uh, small conclusions about this particular portion of the talk, which is about um, that we have this new data set. This is probably the first of this kind that includes a lot of complex common sense inferences. I mean, in some sense, it's easy for us, but it's complex for machines still, because we haven't solved the intuitive inferences yet. Um, and in the promising results we saw uh, um, encourage us to do more of this research through uh, language-based um, representation for closing the gap between perception and cognition. And finally, um, the data set supports more tasks and models than uh, what we were able to explore in our first paper. But here's actual message that I really wanted to say through this talk, which is, um, especially for intuitive common sense inferences, uh, maybe we should really seriously consider language as the symbols, not just the words. Words are not language. It doesn't equate as language, or graphs of words might not be sufficient. Uh, graphs of language would be nice. Um, and then, uh, corollary to that, statement is this idea of looking at reasoning as generative tasks. Traditionally, uh, people studied reasoning more th as a discriminative tasks, um, assuming that you're, you know, some uh, oracle gives you a definition of variables, um, some like a finite set of them, and you just need to choose which uh, variable, uh, the values of the variable should have in some discrete sense. But when it comes to common sense inferences that we do, it seems that the space of reasoning, especially describable in language, is infinite. And when we are faced in that situation, it's almost silly to have like a million different choices to consider one by one, sort their scores, and then pick which one is the top choice. Instead, what the transformers did in our work um, it's doing reasoning by generating word or token uh, one at a time and composing the meaning on the fly. And so that's what NLP people do all the time and there may be a more promising direction to pursue if we think about um, reasoning that requires um, intuitive inferences over uh, a lot of stuff. Now, let me make super brief remarks on precursors of this work, that's text only. And then afterwards, I'm going to make a little bit more philosophical arguments about uh, why we did what we did. So um, there's this atomic, which was presented last year, uh, that's a text only um, inferences. It has this weird format like X repels Y's attack, and it has nine different common sense inference types. So it has more fine-grained, um, elaborate stuff. And again, we have a lot of it. Um, at the time of publication, we had a little bit less than a million if-then rules. But uh, stay tuned, we're going to have a lot more coming out soon. Uh, based on which, we built Common Sense Transformers, also known as a Comet, presented at ACL uh, last year, uh, which started with this philosophical thought, of, thought about how even though, you know, depending on how you look at the scale of our graph, this is very large or it's very small in the universe of everything we know about the world and everything we can reason about the world. So I'm going with the second. Um, it's unlikely that we can crowdsource all of it um, simply because there's probably infinitely many things that we can reason about and a lot, a lot of it we can reason about without having to store the result of reasoning in advance. So, uh, it makes sense for us to do learning, um, to generalize out of the common sense graph. So I'm against retrieval-based reasoning on uh, existing knowledge graph. I am more for dynamic graph, uh, dynamic knowledge uh, generation. So we did this transfer learning from language to knowledge, which sort of compiles the graph into lots of strings of a text. So it's almost like, Atomic now became an additional textbook 
for Comet to read about. And you can go and play with this demo um, available, or you can find the URL online, um, which can reason about things like John gets into an accident. Uh, the model actually never saw this sort of sentence before because Atomic has this form of X against uh, person X gets into an accident with a person Y or something. But um, because um, it's combining pre-trained language models with atomic language, it can reason about um, previously unseen textual forms quite uh, well. So here you see that uh, John might want to call 911 afterwards, which is great because 911 was not even mentioned in the context about the model learned to reason about this um, quite well. Now, at the time of publication, we had no idea how well this works, but um, when I was beginning to give a talk, I started giving weird sentences like, Sanya rides into the sunset on a motorcycle after solving AI. Um, such complex sentences are not part of atomic at all. Um, and of course, it's not really solving, solving um, everything, but the inferences look pretty reasonable. And then um, to have more fun, Gary breaks the world record for most controversial tweet. Um, and our model, which never read about tweet, it doesn't know what tweet is, or he, it, it also doesn't know which Gary I'm talking about. But the model thinks that um, Gary probably wanted to be famous. Um, uh, Gary needed to do research, write a book, uh, write a blog post, which happens to be all true for a certain Gary that we know very well of. And then he might want to celebrate, um, tell everyone about it. And um, he knows that I'm using these examples, by the way. So uh, as a very brief recap about um, the text-only cases, it's a sort of a combination of a self-supervised learning of observed knowledge that's in that, uh, uh, natural language corpus, the language models are trained on, together with um, semi-supervised learning of declarative knowledge. And this is the key point that uh, we are making. Uh, existing language models on their own, they uh, are not yet able to abstract away declarative knowledge in the way that humans are able to do. Um, in some sense though, it might be that humans do need the declarative knowledge in order to learn better. And this is the kind of language that's in the atomic, it's not the one that we use uh, between adult to adult communications, but it's the kind that you do with your children when they're young and they need to learn about the world. It's almost like a textbook common sense knowledge that you provide through uh, particular types of language that you use with your children. So uh, we went with this uh, language as a symbols instead of logic. Um, I can go on and on about that point, but I'll just keep it brief there. Um, and then in our work, we focus more on causes and effects as opposed to encyclopedic knowledge. And by look, using neural representation, we found that uh, the model can generalize far better than what we could have possibly hoped for, for compositional and the previously unseen events. Now, briefly to conclude, early on in the talk, I um, mentioned this uh, two commonly uh, assumed beliefs about uh, you know, what should be symbols and what happened with deep learning. And my position here is that A, we are far from solving system on reasoning. B, uh, it's hard to do broad scope reasoning without language as a symbols. To make that point even uh, harder, uh, let me make some quotes from this book, The Enigma of Reason, uh, that I recently found. And this is really, really great. So. Um, a lot of stuff, I, I, I'm like happy to quote really many sentences, but intuitive inferences is a great deal about extraction of new information from the information already available. Basically, this is what common sense reasoning is all about. We generate a lot of possibilities in our head. Um, it's almost like the stochastic predictions about what may be the feasible intent or things that happened before and after. And none of them has to be completely true but we make these sort of inferences all the time. And then the system two type reasonings are, this is the striking part. Usually, uh, I mean, I mean the, the position that the book makes is that um, these reasons are used primarily not to guide oneself. Uh, guiding here means to make a decision. Uh, usually 
even before reasoning takes off, humans already made a decision. You know, for example, I might have already made a decision about believing that language is really important as a symbol so for neurosymbolic integration. Now that I have to give a talk, now I'm beginning the real reasoning, you know, not to change my decision about it, but to justify my decisions in the eyes of others and to convince other people about that. So the real strong position that the book makes is the reasoning serves the purpose of a communication. It's a sort of like a byproduct of humans being social and we try to convince each other. And um, on a related note, um, just in case you might think system two and system one reasonings are so uh, different and one has nothing to do with the other, that's also not true. Uh, human reasoning is built on top of a bunch of different intuitive inferences in which uh, logic seems to play at best a marginal role. Uh, in case you might wonder whether this is just, um, you know, the point of uh, the position of the book, but not shared by other people, that's not true. Um, in this, uh, another book, How We Reason by Philip Johnson Laird, apparently his previous book about mental models is really the famous one, but I think How We Reason is the sort of like a sequel of the original book, um, which is a um, more recent version that's uh, super nice to read as well. So going back to my previous uh, point about reasoning, um, especially for intuitive inferences or common sense inferences, uh, it seems that uh, we should seriously consider language as the symbols. And in doing so, we can really attack a new sort of generative reasoning that we've never uh, done before uh, because of these new uh, transformers that allow us to uh, generate uh, reasoning in a more um, uh, compositional way and then also uh, in a robust way against the previously unseen events. Thank you. Thank you, Yejin. So um, I have, have also collected a lot of good questions from the audience. So um, the first question uh, that someone have is that uh, in the Titanic example, which is the, uh, you know, the film screenshot example, um, you show that uh, like, uh, so how, basically that example shows how we are lacking in having machine learning agents which can navigate and, and experience the world as we do, as we human do uh, with all our motivations. So uh, why and how do you think it is a valid assumption um, to, uh, uh, to, you know, to, so that like the, such knowledge, such common sense knowledge can be obtained from natural language data sets like the ones you mentioned? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a question that I get often uh, that, you know, gaining this knowledge from language or even crowdsourced language seems like almost a dirty thing to do because maybe we should learn all this by having agents, at least, you know, if not in the real world, uh, interact in the simulated world. The real challenge of learning from simulated environment though is that right now we are, you know, it's almost like pushing the hard task of uh, reasoning about causes and effects um, down to software engineer who's going to build the simulation environment. So um, if the software engineer didn't build anything about sinking ship in the world, then the agent is not going to learn anything about it. And I don't know if robots can really, you know, interact with the kitchen and learn, you know, what happens if you burn bread in the oven. And so um, I am still quite uh, sympathetic about learning in the simulation environment because it does allow us to study models that are um, more multimodal and learn shared representations across different types of perceptual signals together with higher level concepts um, that might be uh, you know best represented through language uh, but it's likely that that alone is not going to really solve ai all the way and we might gain so much from uh, making the better use of a language okay thank you and uh, the, the, the second question that is, um, so you mentioned that uh, it is better to evaluating, uh, you know, to, to study the reasoning task as a generative task. And this makes a lot of sense, but um, um, it seems that evaluating generative tasks is much harder than evaluating discriminative tasks. So how do you think uh, we are going to address this issue? 
Yeah, that's a really great question. Thank you so much for asking that. So evaluating a discriminative tasks like multiple choice questions, uh, it's so nice because you know it's a clean cut. Uh, there's no question about it. But here's the problem with AI research framed just by that. Uh, it's almost like giving you know a lot of exam problems to the computers and then hope that something really good comes out of it. But if we think about the time when we were students, uh, some of which you might still be, you know, you can just learn a lot about the data set bias or exam bias by looking at a lot of you know question answer pairs. Imagine a professor teaching nothing but giving you uh, 10,000 QA problems to practice on for the exams. Probably you can do some learning, but it's really going to be hard to figure out what exactly is going on with the particular content. So in that sense, um, it's good to uh, think about different modes of learning. And of course, uh, self-supervised or unsupervised learning in general seems the better way to go except that I don't know whether just adding more layers to transformers and more data to the transformers will lead to the kind of um, abstract common sense knowledge that we know about the world. Um, and since we don't know how to acquire that just yet, um, it's good to um, uh, address it by sort of setting up this crowdsourced the data set over which you can do generative reasoning and evaluation. About the evaluation, um, um, that's actually the challenge that we face in NLP field anyways, and uh, it seems that there are more and more new research um, that tries to have more model-based evaluation on natural language generation quality, like a BERT score, and I believe that there are some follow-up work as well. So um, we just need to do more research for um, better evaluating generative reasoning. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's very insightful. And uh, let's uh, thank uh, Ye Jing again for her uh, great talk.